<laughs> you know, you, on these actions, you play a note, and, and the key has to come all the way to where it started before it can play again. It doesn't, so it's the, the single escapement action. So, but the, uh, and of course, this trap work had multifarious problems. And, uh, we did come up with a machine screw to mount the lyre. Uh, I'm, I'm real particular about always making sure legs and lyres are real solid on pianos because usually they're not That's on right. pianos. They're usually kind of tenuous and for, for safety and liability reasons. And, and, and I'm, my attitude is, well, um, I, could, I could have my customers spend a few hundred more dollars and really make sure the, the, all the legs and the lyre are really solidly mounted so they're going to be trouble free for probably the rest of their lifetime. Or I could try to save my customer a few hundred bucks, and then when the piano falls down, somebody can sue me, or or I can get complaints because the lyre fell off, and I can say, well, that's how it was when I found it. It already it, those screws they're pretty stripped, you know. Uh, yeah, somebody should have done something about that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I have just I just don't even make it a choice. I I, I charge them to recheck and remount as needed. These square brand legs are big wooden threads. And so you, you, you actually screw them on, just in threaded fashion. But what you hope happens is that just when they get tight, these things are lined up with the case. And like in this case, they kept going so that it's the little, this would be sticking out here. So we, we actually had to do some shimming. Uh, actually, use some of that. Uh, have y'all used this new synthetic uh, buckskin, this Xane? Uh, uh, it's, it's a cool material. And um, uh, it... Uh, um, we use some of that, and it's 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 real durable and seems to seems to do a good job. So, um, you might explain the high pitched squeal. I think it's that toilet over there. Oh, um, <laughs> well, I thought it was your your. Oh no, no, it's just a funny little. I don't think it's leaking, but it's, it's, it's it needs some attention. Okay, all right. It's kind of like a squeaky pedal, you know. Okay. Uh, but here's what's going on. So I made a new thing here. <laughs> Uh, oh, and then we made an entire wooden block. In fact, I have an old pin block that we, and if y'all are looking, okay, everybody want to pick up? <laughs> now, these are too heavy. I, I wouldn't ask you to pick this up because uh, it, we might drop it or you get a hernia or something. But uh, but uh, this had some kind of funny, you know, some of these old pianos, they had to, like, you'd stick the lyre up and then you'd put a couple of, like, pins to hold the lyre in place. And right. those, those always, you know, deteriorate. Um, so we made a nice, uh, solid thing, and it's got a machine screw that goes in there. So, um, Well, that old system worked great at the factory, didn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and probably for 20, 30, 40 years later, they still were good, and they, they were probably fairly trouble-free. But after 100 or 75, 100, 125 years, they, they, they're not what they were. Right. The other thing that we you face know. with pianos is pin block replacement. And... Um, it's another one of those things that you can, you can, you know, they make tuning pins as big as number seven. So theoretically, there's no reason you can't just keep putting bigger tuning pins in. Every, you know, every time um, the old ones quit holding or the piano starts to sound bad or somebody wants to freshen it up, well, you can just keep putting in those bigger tuning pins. But uh, uh, as a piano rebuilder, number one, I, I, my motivation is I make more money by putting a nice new pin block in than if I just restring with bigger pins. And uh, so I make more money uh, and incur less risk because if I make a, a good, well-fit, well-crafted pin block, um, it's really rare for there to be any kind of a, a callback issue or a warranty issue. If, I, if I tr I'm trying to save my customer money, then it turns out I'm, taking a, I'm getting paid less and I'm taking more of a risk. So in, in weighing those two things, it's getting to where I just hardly will agree not to replace a pin block if we're also rebuilding something. Because now, you know, 15-year-old Yamaha, I'm, you know, you can restring those. And I'm sure it's, it's in most cases, it's going to work. I did have a bad experience with, um, I guess it was a 35 or 40-year-old European piano that you can actually see the pin block from the front. And it was this multiple, and it looked great. I mean, I, I, it, I had no reason to doubt that this, you know, this thing should be able to be restrung. But on the contrary, it couldn't. <laughs> And so I really had some, some trouble with that piano, and, and I was trying to save the poor piano teacher. You know, she was trying to just barely afford it, and what's my husband going to save when he sees how much this costs? And, you know, so, so anyway, so I, I, I really, I'm, I'm at a point in my life when I'm, I'm really pretty much insisting on pin blocks. I've never re 
put a pin block in a square grand before, but this this square grand is getting a new pin block. And um, um, pay no attention to these pieces. I'll put them later. Um, and then, you know, this is something you could do with an upright piano. And there's also some some uh, you know older European and Victorian era American pianos where you know. It, it, it is not very feasible to actually remove the, the pin block like on a modern grand, like the, the Victorian grands where it has the, the, the three-quarter plate where the plate comes like this and they have a big wide thing uh, that comes down here and then the pin block slopes down. That kind of piano, is a, this is a good technique for that. So uh, we essentially um, decided where the new pin block material would be. This is a, a five-ply maple uh, from... Uh, Andre Bulldog, it's the pin block material we've been using for, oh, I guess, eight, nine years now. And uh, once I learned the right size drill bit to use on it, it seems to, <laughs> to be okay. Uh, so this is, you know, a uh, base and then the little tinner and then a, a little separate one here. Now we've, we've gotten these, we got these marked by, uh, first of all, we, we get, a, we, we put them in so that they can actually be removed again because you could you could actually pound these things in there and they would they'd be totally stuck and you couldn't get them out so um, and and I appreciate it if y'all wouldn't try to press these in as deep as you can because, uh, I mean, we, could we could probably get them out but um, this this had a weird feature in that the base was a little elevated so we just this is some bridge capping maple that we that we fit this. I say we, it was actually Jim Watson, but it's the imperial we, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> but so anyway, Jim fit this to the plate. This is this is the plate over here that is lashed to the mast there. Um, so, so this fellow's fitting right in here. And the way I like to mark uh, tuning pins is actually we, we get them completely, uh, you know, where we want them. And then I have a series of drill bits that just fit into whatever size these, these holes are so that there's not really too much, uh, you know, uh, uncertainty about where they go. And uh, it just drills a little dimple. It's, it's a real definite little spot so that, and, and I like to drill these on a drill press. Uh, some piano rebuilders will have a drill press that they put on the piano and they do it in the piano, uh, but that's not the system that I have ever used and I don't, I'm not attracted to it. So um, we, we drill them on the drill press. And so we'll, we'll be drilling these on the drill press, and then probably glue like some very thin little paper on the bottom, maybe just at the, so that when we glue this in, the, the glue doesn't all rise up mm -hmm. into the, the tuning pin holes. Right. Um, and, and these, of course, the, these are, these have uh, screw holes that are in the new pin block material, but then there are some screw holes that are in the old material. So if you're in lane, uh, like, and if you, this would apply to an upright or a square rand or really any time you'd use this technique, um, you would, uh, you would, uh, you know, it's good to get the, the screw attachments done that way. Um, How did you get the old pin block off? Ah, sir, I'm glad you asked. Let me just show you a couple of pictures. <laughs> so, um, there's a variety of ways you could get them out, but what we decided was, uh, I got this very nice uh, $75 one inch carbide Forstner bit. And uh, it's really sharp. Forstner bits get dull, and it's very difficult to resharpen them. But um, oh, yeah. we just started drilling, drilling, drilling. Uh, yeah, we, so plenty of plenty of. Uh, maybe we can reconstitute that old ancient maple into something good. I don't know. What, but. <laughs> you more or less just chewed the old one out. <laughs> yeah, but in a controlled scientific way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's about it. And this is a big half inch drill, and this is a, a depth stop. Again, you could use routers. There's a lot of systems you could use, but this is pretty direct. And if, and if it's just a matter of removing a lot of wood, well, it seems to be a, a pretty good one. And you, I mean, and the depth is pretty close, and you can <coughs> work it down later. Um, the combination, and then routing and chiseling. And so it's kind of a routing, chiseling kind of a thing. See. So that's that's the, the square grand pictures. Uh, since we're just talking about pin blocks, though, I, I think I'll invite everybody to go on the back porch, and I'm going to show you uh, a pin block that we're fitting.